Hey all you cool cats and kittens, I'm Ben Starr, the Ultimate Food Geek. Welcome to my messy kitchen. And we are currently in the very middle of the social distancing, stay at home quarantine of the coronavirus pandemic here in the United States. And apparently all y'all are now making sourdough. And as somebody who's been baking sourdough bread since I was a little kid and been giving away sourdough starter for the last decade or so, I am thrilled to welcome you to the sourdough community. But I have learned that every time I gift somebody sourdough starter, they are super excited, they bake a couple of loaves, and then they don't ever make sourdough again. And I blame all of you wonderful professional bakers and super serious amateur bakers that have these YouTube videos and, and websites that are teaching folks the modernist high hydration sourdough technique, which is way too hard. You got all of these terms from Autolys and Levan and the slap and fold and strength thing and all these steps where you have to interact with that dough every hour or so for literally 24 to 36 hours to produce a loaf of bread. And folks, sourdough bread has been around since before there was electricity or thermometers or scales or temperature controlled bulk fermentation chambers. Sourdough bread is actually really, really, really easy to make. I don't have time for all that shit that those people are telling you. So today I am going to teach you how to make a very, very simple loaf of sourdough bread. It's gonna require no more than five minutes on the first day and then no more than 10 minutes of your actual active time on the day you bake the bread to get it to the point where it is ready to go in your mouth. Uh, I like to have sourdough bread almost every single day and this is my technique for those of you who like me are super lazy and have better things to do. Now, if you're the kind of person that's like, Hurry, quick, get to the recipe. Just show it to me. Get the hell off my YouTube channel. I am the food geek and it is my responsibility to teach you the chemistry and physics behind cooking so that you stop being a recipe follower and start being somebody that truly understands cooking and does not need recipes. All right, to that end, I am first going to talk about our four ingredients for sourdough bread so that when I begin actually starting the loaf, you'll see start to finish exactly how quick and easy it really is. Okay, first things first, your starter. Starter is the most important part of your sourdough recipe. And I'm guessing since you're watching this video, you already have a starter. Either you started it from scratch or a friend gifted it to you, you got it from a local bakery. If you don't yet have a sourdough starter, they're actually super easy to make and I'll teach you how to do that in a separate, uh, separate video. But for now, we've got sourdough starter. Mine was started about 10 years ago from organic rye flour and water. And uh, it's been going ever since. There's no commercial yeast in here at all. Now, folks uh, tend to get really picky about starter and say your starter has to be mature before you bake a load of for bread. That is also bullshit. <laughs> the best loaf of sourdough I've ever made, I pulled my starter out of the fridge after it had been in the back of the fridge for two months while I was road tripping out west. It had that layer of brown, uh, dark liquid on top of it. It smelled weird, not bad, but weird. I baked the most exquisitely flavorful loaf of bread without having even fed the starter. I just stirred it back together and measured out my four ounces to make my recipe. So don't get all crazy about your starter has to be freshly fed or mature or all that malarkey. Just take it out of the fridge, stir it if the water has separated from the top of it and it's gonna be ready to go, all right? Trust me on this. Second ingredient, salt. Don't use iodized salt. Iodine's goal is to kill microbes and yeast is a microbe, a fungus to be exact. So you wanna make sure you're using a sea salt, kosher salt, something like that. As long as it is not iodized, you'll be good to go because you're measuring by weight. Water. Filtered water is what I always use to produce sourdough bread. I just get it from my filter in the fridge. Now there are plenty of my friends that make the bread using my starter that say tap water is completely fine. But most tap water does contain chlorine or chloramines and their goal is also to kill microbes. And what is yeast? And lactobacillus, the bacterial colony that's in our starter from the air and from our hands. These are microbes and uh, your water system from your public water supply is designed to kill them. So I recommend you use some type of filter to bottled water. But as I've said, my friends say water from the tap works just fine. Now, flour. You get a lot of folks saying that the type of flour you use is crucial. This is a regular organic, unbleached, all-purpose bread flour that I get at Costco. It's the flour I use most frequently, but I've used plenty of other flours. You don't have to be particularly picky about which flour you use. 
use what you've got. Uh, a lot of folks also really like to make whole grain, and I will tell you that you will not have great success making sourdough with high percentages of whole grain flours. You'll see all those professional folks on YouTube that use a slight amount of whole grain in combination with bread flour and all that other stuff to get that perfect crumb. I recommend you substitute no more than eight ounces of whole grain flour in this recipe. And if you are gonna use whole grain flour, you're gonna add a little bit more water because whole grain flour absorbs more water. It takes a little bit more water to get a perfect loaf out of that. We'll get there uh, in just a bit. So I'm gonna show you how simple it is start to finish to get this bread started on the first day. The only special ingredient you need to make sourdough bread is a kitchen scale. If you don't have one, shame on you, order one right now. You cannot bake without a scale, no matter what anybody tells you. All right. So, I'm gonna zero out my scale with my bowl on top and I'm gonna add four ounces of starter. That's 2.7, 3.8, and 4.2, fine. I'm gonna run with it. 12 ounces of water. I'm not gonna be picky about the temperature of the water. This water just comes straight out of the filter on my fridge. We're gonna add 12 ounces of filtered water. The only thing I would recommend is not using warm water. You don't really wanna jump start the fermentation too quickly. All right, 12 ounces of filtered water. Now I'm gonna stir my starter into my water, get it kinda distributed evenly. Now I'm gonna add my flour, one pound and four ounces total. Now if you're substituting some whole wheat, you can do eight ounces of whole wheat and then make up the rest of it uh, with an unbleached flour. That's particularly fine. If you're gonna do that though, I'm gonna ask you to add an extra one ounce of water if you're adding eight ounces of whole wheat flour because uh, that will give you a slightly better texture. All right, we are at one pound and four ounces of flour, and finally, about three-fourths of an ounce of salt. That's somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8 on my scale. Now, I'm gonna stir that together. Technically, this is a no-need recipe, and you really don't have to touch the dough if you don't want to, uh, but there's a final step here I'll show you that'll just make it a little bit nicer for you. But get that stirred around well, scrape the sides of the bowl. You just wanna make sure all of your flour gets moistened. Also helps with the final cleanup. And at this point, it becomes a little bit harder to use the spoon. So I like to finish this process with my hands. And yes, technically this is kneading, but we're gonna do it for less than 10 seconds. I'm just gonna kind of get that dough nice and cohesive together in the bowl. If it's a little bit sticky to your hands, don't worry about that. All right, well, that's it. Now, I can cover this with plastic wrap, or if you're making multiple loaves and don't wanna take up so much space on your countertop, you can spray a one gallon Ziploc bag with a little cooking spray, transfer the loaf into it. Either way, that's all you gotta do the first day. Set it on your countertop and 12 to 24 hours later, you'll be ready to bake. Well, let's talk for just a bit about sourdough starter. This is nothing more than a paste of flour and water that is alive with a symbiosis between bacterial colonies and yeast colonies. Yeast are technically a fungus, uh, and you've got these wild yeasts that were living on the individual kernels of wheat as they were growing in the field. That's a naturally occurring uh, relationship between those wild yeasts and the, the grains that they are eager to ferment and get a hold of. And then lactobacillus bacteria. These are bacterial colonies that live all over our skin. Everybody's got their own unique lactobacillus colony on their skin. It's also floating around in the air in our kitchen. So your sourdough starter is going to be unique to your kitchen. Doesn't matter if you got the starter from somewhere else, as long as you've been feeding it the flour from your kitchen and it gets exposed to your hands and the air in your kitchen, that is your sourdough starter. And it is chemically different from any other starter on the planet. You've got something very, very special that you're working with. Now, folks tend to treat starter as a very finicky thing. I remember my mom used to feed her starter multiple times a day. She named it Willie, uh, and it required so much attention, but it turns out, 
sourdough starter is not really as finicky as people say it does. As long as it is not completely dead, which would take months without a feeding or in improper conditions like extreme heat uh, to actually kill that starter. And as I mentioned before, the most delicious loaf of bread I've ever baked was with a starter that had not been fed in two months. So don't get super crazy about making sure you have to time the feeding of your starter before you bake this loaf of bread. In fact, the only time I ever feed my starter is when I run out of starter. So I'll keep it in there for several weeks as I bake bread and my starter diminishes and diminishes. And then when it looks like I've got less than about half a cup of starter left, I will feed it by adding typically eight ounces of flour, eight ounces of water, stirring it, let it sit on the countertop uh, for an hour and then chuck it back in the fridge. But do not be concerned about your starter. Don't think that you've killed your starter just because it's been in your fridge without feeding for a month or two. It's probably gonna be fine. Uh, people say to let your nose be the judge as if your starter has gone bad. Y'all, your starter is not going to go bad. If you've nourished a healthy colony of yeast and bacteria in here, they're going to fight off invasion by any bad bacteria. So unless the thing is completely covered in mold and smells like pure rot, it can go through a whole array of unique smells because this fermentation process does produce ethyl alcohol otherwise known as booze or technically beer, right? Uh, so there are many smells that can come out of your starter. And unless you've been baking for several years and you're accustomed to all those smells, it might be unusual enough to make you concerned. Don't be. Stir it together and use it. Welcome back, it is day two. And as you can see, my dough has basically doubled in size, which means it's ready to bake. Now this can take anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, and it does not have to be precise. This bread was actually ready to bake about six hours ago. I've just let it continue to sit. Nice thing about sourdough is that it works slowly. Now if your starter has been five or six weeks since it's been fed, it may take a full 24 hours uh, for the dough to get to this kind of doubling in size. But don't get too paranoid about making sure whether it's exactly doubled, really, this bread is very forgiving. Uh, so just go ahead within 12 to 24 hours and proceed to the next step. Now, before I shape the dough into a loaf, I wanna talk a little bit about how you're gonna bake this bread. Now, a lot of folks really do love to do the Dutch oven baking method, uh, which if you don't have a Dutch oven, we'll talk about a loaf pan in just a second. I like to use this regular five quart uh, enameled cast iron Dutch oven I picked up for 25 bucks on sale. Uh, and that produces a really lovely kind of oval, rustic, old world sort of a shape. I also have these little three quart Dutch ovens. And sometimes I really like to use these as well because that gives me a nice high and tight loaf with a bigger, more open texture. But basically whatever size, if you've got a cast iron Dutch oven, whether it's enameled or not, it's gonna bake a really superior loaf of bread because of the way that it holds in the steam during the initial baking part of the face mimics those wood-fired old world ovens. The only catch here is that what your rising vessel needs to sort of approximate your cooking vessel in size, right? So I've got this uh, silver bowl that's approximately the same size as this Dutch oven. If I was baking in my smaller Dutch oven, I would want to use a much smaller bowl than this because this bowl is clearly much too large uh, for this particular baking vessel. But today I'm going with this guy, so I'm gonna use this shape. All right, you want to line your bowl with a soft kitchen towel. They call these flour sack towels. You can get them in packs of five for five or six bucks at the market. Uh, but if you don't have that, you can use any soft kitchen towel. Uh, in a pinch, you could use uh, paper towels perhaps. Uh, but just really kind of avoid the terry cloth kitchen towels because those tend to kind of grab onto the dough and it gets really stuck. Now you want to flour this flour sack towel very heavily with your flour. I'm gonna set that aside. And you wanna flour your surface uh, that you're gonna shape your loaf on very lightly, just a little bit of flour. I'm gonna gently remove the bread from the bowl. Now, when you're baking with commercial yeast, they tell you, oh, punch it down and knead it again before you form your loaf. Don't do this with sourdough. You want to use as light a hand as you possibly can. That wild yeast is not nearly as robust as commercial yeast, so any nice aeration or air bubbles that you've been able to create in that dough, you don't want to push out, so treat it gently. 
Now this is the only part of the entire process that it's gonna take you a few times to get accustomed to, and that is shaping this into a loaf. So you wanna flour your hands nice, and then kind of start to tuck the edges of that loaf underneath itself. Using the bottom part of your hands, you're gonna scrape along the table or the, the work surface to kind of continue tucking the ends. You can kind of move around in a clockwise motion and pull towards yourself. And you'll notice that this is starting to give us a nice smooth loaf. Continue to flour your hands. You don't want that bread dough to stick to your hands. And once you've done this four or five times, you kind of brought it into a nice tight boule, which is the French term for it. It's ready to go into the rising bowl. So you want to Dust it very nicely and generously with flour, top and bottom. And then we're going to set that beautiful little bowl right there in our rising vessel. Cover it. And now it needs to sit on the counter for probably two to four hours. It'll be ready to bake when it is almost doubled in size. You don't have to get too precise with that. Uh, but if your starter is robust and has been fed recently, maybe ready to go into the oven in two hours. But realistically, four is about what you're looking for. Now, for those of you that don't have a Dutch oven and are going to be baking this in a regular loaf pan, I do want to show you uh, how to form the loaf for that. Just make sure you spray your loaf pan really good. You can also rub it with butter or oil if you don't have cooking spray. And I've got a second loaf that I started in secret behind your back that I've kept here in this uh, Ziploc bag. So again, I wanna treat this gingerly. Don't wanna bash it around and lose some of that beautiful aeration that we have uh, allowed to happen. And once that dough is out onto the surface, Flour your hands again, so you don't want them sticking, and kind of arrange the dough carefully to where it's in a rectangle, approximately the length of your loaf pan. Now we're gonna gently begin rolling that loaf up. And now it is time to just transfer it right into the loaf pan. Now there are many different ways to shape a loaf of bread. Your mom and grandma probably have a different way, sealing and tucking the ends under. But when you're working with sourdough, again, we wanna degas that loaf as little as possible uh, so that we retain all those beautiful air bubbles inside there. Now we're gonna cover this loaf with plastic wrap or a kitchen towel and same thing two to four hours on the countertop until it's about doubled in size, and then it'll be ready for the oven. Now, most of us are very busy humans, and more times than I can count, life has intervened in my sourdough baking plans. So if on bake day, once you've formed that loaf, you determine that you're really not gonna be around to get that loaf into the oven in that two to four hour window, no worries. Just put the loaf in the fridge as quickly as possible after forming it, and it will sit there quite happily for one or even two, sometimes up to three days before you put it in the oven. Now, if you happen to delay the bread baking using the refrigerator as an accident, time will reward you because the longer that dough sits in that cold fridge where the activity of the microbes is slowed down, you develop all sorts of delicious complexity of flavor in your bread. So if you have the luxury of beginning your planning for a special loaf two, three, or four days in advance, I will often intentionally start my bread for a weekend dinner party on Monday or Tuesday and let it rise in the fridge very, very slowly. This is called retarding the fermentation, and it definitely produces a significantly, noticeably more superior loaf in terms of flavor. It does quite often hinder the texture just a little bit. The loaf tends to be a little bit more dense if you spent extra time in the fridge before baking, but the return that you get in flavor is often quite worth it, in my opinion. About an hour before you bake your bread, you want to preheat your oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty hot. Also, if you're baking in a Dutch oven, you want that Dutch oven inside your oven as it preheats. And ideally, we are looking at rack placement of the second to lowest rack. 
you definitely want to make sure that your Dutch oven isn't making any contact with the elements at the top of the oven. And if you have to use the very lowest rack, you'll discover you're getting some, some burning and scorching on the bottom of your loaf of bread. So the second to lowest is ideal. Also, if the handle on your Dutch oven is anything other than metal, it's probably the best idea to go ahead and just remove that handle. You can still lift the lid with oven mitts from the sides, but you don't want to deal with a melting, stinky plastic handle. And at 500 degrees, there aren't really any materials other than metal that are particularly oven safe at that temperature. Now, if you're baking in a regular loaf pan, don't worry about anything. Just a nice 30 minute preheat of your oven to 500 degrees will be completely sufficient. So from here on out, things are going to move pretty quickly. My oven's been preheating 500 degrees for about an hour, and I've just pulled my screaming hot Dutch oven out. It is time to score the bread. Now, you'll notice a lot of the fancy folks on YouTube use a French device called a lame. Some people mispronounce it lame, but that's just lame. And uh, that's completely unnecessary. They'll talk about different scoring angles and depths, but for all intents and purposes, you can produce a spectacular loaf with just using regular kitchen scissors or any type of scissor. So I'm gonna give this particular uh, loaf a triple score. I gotta make two cuts in the middle because it's so large. And it's ready to go in the pot. Be careful, Dutch oven is excruciatingly, extremely hot. This next part takes a little bit of practice, but by the time you've done three or four of these loaves, you'll be fine. You wanna make sure you kind of anchor your towel underneath the bread and hold the bowl securely in your non-dominant hand. You take your dominant hand, gently lay it onto the surface of the bread, and you're gonna invert this bread into your palm, gently pull off the towel, and gently set the bread into the hot Dutch oven. <coughs> Don't work so quickly that you forget to put your kitchen gloves back on. Then the lid goes on top of the Dutch oven and it goes into the 500 degree oven. Immediately turn the oven temperature down to 425 and set your timer for 30 minutes. Now if you're baking in a loaf pan, gently remove the covering. Got a very nice rise here on this loaf. And we're going to score as well using our kitchen scissors here. Just three cuts across the top. You'll start to notice some deflation. That's completely fine. Now this is gonna go into that preheated 500 degree oven for 30 minutes. And then we're gonna check it. All right, it's been 30 minutes, so it's time to take the lid off the Dutch oven. You can see my uh, loaf is doing quite well. It'll probably be done in another 10 minutes or so. And taking the lid off of our Dutch allows us to get a nice kind of deep browning on the remainder of that bread. Now the Dutch oven bread's gonna go 15 more minutes uncovered at 425, but something tells me that loaf of bread's gonna be done in another five minutes or so, so I'm gonna take its temperature pretty quick and uh, see what's going on. Now it's only been about five minutes, but I really wanna get an internal temperature on that loaf that I'm baking in the loaf pan. Now, sourdough is done between 205 and 210 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm at 204 right now, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull my loaf. It only needed about 35 minutes to be fully baked. I am gonna turn my loaf of bread out here onto a cooling rack. And if you don't have an instant read thermometer like this, you really should, uh, but you honestly don't need it when bread baking. It's a very important tool, especially for cooking meats. You can really pretty much rely on sight in terms of the color of the loaf uh, in order to determine if it's done. Got a nice kind of hollow thump when I tap it. It's deeply browned and golden and uh, that's gonna be delicious. Now, do not cut into your bread the instant it comes out of the oven. That will gum up your bread knife and give you a really gummy kind of texture. You always wanna slice after the bread has cooled a little bit, and if you just can't get away from that 
strong, gripping desire for fresh, warm bread right out of the oven, at least give it 10 minutes before you start to cut. But ideally, let it cool fully, and that will let the structure firm up and solidify. You won't have any of that gumminess. Then slice it, put it back in the oven or even in the microwave for 30 seconds to rewarm it uh, for serving at the table. All right, it's been 15 minutes uncovered for a total baking time of 45 minutes for my Dutch oven loaf here. I'm gonna dump that out. Notice we haven't gotten any burning here on the underside, which is a good thing. And that is a gorgeous, gorgeous loaf of bread. Now, no offense to the folks that like to build a levain and then auto lease their dough and add their salt at a later point and do lots of flipping and folding and strength building in their doughs. Yes, that loaf of bread they're making is better than this loaf of bread. But see how much effort I put into this? Practically none. I wasn't spending every hour doing something else to my dough. So if I can produce this kind of loaf of bread multiple times a week with practically no effort, as compared to this Herculean task of babysitting this dough throughout a 24 to 36 hour process before you can finally eat it, I'm gonna choose this method. I'm gonna let this guy sit for about an hour, and I'm gonna come back, cut it open, and show you how beautiful it is. Time for the moment of truth. We're gonna cut open this beautiful loaf after it has fully cooled. Nice and crunchy crust. And there we go. Now, that texture is not as open as the sourdough recipes you will find with high hydration. But if you are the type of person that began to read that recipe which said, at 8 a.m. build your levain, and at 9.30 a.m. start the autolyse, and then watched it progress in hour to two hour increments for the next 48 hours, this is the bread for you. It is moist, delicious, incredibly full of flavor with a super crunchy, thin crust. Mmm. Just begs for some salted butter or fresh olive oil. Let me tell you, five minutes on day one, ten-ish minutes and a little bit more work on day two can provide you with a loaf of homemade sourdough that is every bit as delicious as any you will get at a local artisan bakery. So, I hope you have enjoyed this lovely little expose on sourdough bread. My name is Ben Starr. I'm the ultimate food geek. Hit me up at benstar.com. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Stay home, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day.